I like your background. Oh, I thank you very much. I try to find uh, nice, relaxing uh, backgrounds to bring to, <laughs> to meetings. Um, I have other ones that are a bit more um, distracting, depending on the occasion. Um, but oh, I try yeah. not to, you know, something like this, for instance. <laughs> um, that one's popular to bring out once in a while. And mm -hmm. having had a bit too much uh, free time on my hands, I also put this one together. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Welcome to Academically Distance, a series of discussions with people from all across FSU on their experiences in life and academia during the time of COVID. I'm Tom Cruise, the Digital Media Manager over at FSU Libraries, and today I'm joined by Dr. Lisa Liceno, who is the Assistant Dean of the Graduate School and the Director of PI, which is the Program for Instructional Excellence whose events I'm happy to report do often include PI, and the program director of the Fellow Society. And Lisa is also the advisor to the Diversity and Inclusion in Research and Teaching organization, also known as Directo. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Tom. It sounds like I might have actually accomplished something. <laughs> I just read what's on your bio. <laughs> I do that stuff. You did. You do that stuff. So how have you been? How's it going? I I've been good. I've been good. I, I you know, I'm lucky. I, I'm lucky to uh, be doing very well in these strange times. Miss my family. They live up north, but I talk to them quite often. And my parents, of course, worry a lot about me being down here by myself. But, you know, I got lots of friends and neighbors. I always say, you know, I worry more about you. You're going out to the grocery store and, you know, they're in their 80s now. Like stay home, you know. <laughs> I order my groceries on the phone and go pick them up. They're going in the store and crawling around. And like, don't do that. So well, the, yeah, I'm doing well though. I'm I'm actually enjoying working at home. So um, not that I don't miss seeing people face to face, but so tell tell me a little bit more about that. How does it compare with uh, going into the office on the daily? Yeah, well, you know, obviously the the reason I want to, you know preface this all by saying, obviously, the reason we have to stay home is not a good one. And I want to acknowledge that, that the pandemic is a, a very, you know, awful occurrence. So I don't want to be too happy about the fact that I'm working from home in that sense. But academia suited me well when I was a PhD student. And, and you know, before that, uh, just a student at all times in my life, because uh, I'm a college student, that is because I could work from home, I could work on my dissertation from home, just went up to campus for classes and office hours. I miss that. I'm mm -hmm. not really the nine to fiver, but I do it. I do it when I have to. I enjoy being able to take my time in the morning and cut off an hour and a half driving from Crawfordville back and forth, fill up the gas tank once, what, every three months instead of once a week. So it's all good stuff. So, yeah, when I talk to my students on Zoom, I try and remind them, let's think of something positive that, that's come out of this for all of us, because there are positives, you know. In, in what capacity do you, do you spend time with students? I'd like to know a little bit more about what it is you do with your work. It's a lot of events, you know. So the first thought when, you know, everything happened as far as us shutting down the physical um, part of campus, of being there physically, was, oh, geez, what am I, you know, I just got done with a big event for the Fellow Society, a two-day event. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, got to pack up and go to our houses, right? And I was very proud of the fact that right away, my, my grad assistants, I have one for each program, thank goodness, they're a huge help we right away decided, okay, we're gonna just move everything to online. We're, we're not, none of us were experienced with Zoom, but we're like, we'll figure it out. So we did and it's been fantastic as far as we've had so, my, so many more participants from far away, from overseas, distance learners, especially for the, you know, the PI program helping TAs across campus to hone their teaching skills but and learn best practices. And now PI is in such high demand because it's like I'm trying to support them with the online teaching. 
which they're, you know, a lot of them have never done before, where we might have gotten 30 people at a pie workshop and half of them were there to get the pie and coffee, I'm sure. <laughs> um, now, and 30 is not bad, mind you. I'm, I'm happy getting 30 at an at a in-person event. But now we get like 90, 100. We get faculty that attend. I, I feel really good about that as a director in the sense that I'm fulfilling a need that they have. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the content of a regular Pi event? So if you're, you're coming in person, what can you expect from that in particular? Right. Um, Besides Pi, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I told them you got to bring your own Pi. Uh, that I've been trying to figure out how to send them Pi, but I think uh, <laughs> the powers that be would not allow me to take on that kind of budget to send them all a piece of Pi. Right now, since online teaching is not exactly my area of expertise i'm not afraid to admit right socrates said the wisest person is the one that admits what they don't know and i don't know a ton about online teaching i'm learning with everybody else i'm bringing in experts from the office of distance learning from the department or the yeah you know, the higher ed at fsu has an awesome group of people over there that knows all about teaching online, educational psychology and learning systems. I invite them to give workshops. So we have the experts come in and we did a two week boot camp on designing an online course, how to put your Canvas site together or how to put learning objectives together and activities together. Now you have time to work on your own courses and design your own um, tools and Canvas site and activities. Again, missing the personal, you know, face-to-face, -face, but you can re recreate that to some extent with the breakout rooms. <laughs> there's there's intrinsic value in also getting the opportunity to be the student in, in a workshop uh, experience where you're, <laughs> you're learning the ins and outs of what it's like not only to teach, but to learn online and, you know, be able to have that, that empathetic um, experience, you know, for, for someone who might not be familiar with it. Um, it's, it still impresses me what it's taken and what people have been able to accomplish, like, you know, you and your colleagues when it comes to meeting the demand, not only for, you know, just keeping things running, but to, you know, be able to help instructors and educators get used to such strange and unprecedented times. I am impressed by the, the faculty and the grad students. I, you know, I'm here to help them in my position, but they're the ones that are out there on the front lines doing it. And to, especially after, after spring break in the spring, bam, you come back, you're online, never taught online or maybe taught online once, but a lot of them never ever taught online or have, you know, I've taken a couple online classes. So that helped a little, you know, that helps a little bit, but you know, maybe have no experience and all of a sudden they're, they're just, they have to jump into that format. It's incredible what they've all done. So you've described yourself, and these are your words, as, as someone who is uh, old school when it comes to, to teaching. You've been doing it for over 20 years now? Yeah, it's, about, it's almost exactly 20 years, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what, what is time? Sometimes I try not to remember what year it is, uh, but that's neither, neither here nor there. Uh, oh, I'll be writing a check, Tom, and it'll be like, okay, what year is it? 1998? Oh, man. Will, will we revert back to checks? Is that where, where things will go? <laughs> Yeah, that'll date me just saying I'm writing a check. <laughs> I mean, that's not outside the realm of possibility. Maybe we're going back to, to card sorting Dewey Decimal Systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe, we'll take, maybe we'll take checks then for uh, late fees. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> do you accept wheat? Um, <laughs> anyways, all that to say, <laughs> given, given your experience being more, more of an analog teacher, um, what, what do you see as, as some of the challenges when it comes to being able to, to teach online or even to teach others to teach online? When I, the last time I taught was last summer and I had not taught for about six years. Hmm. And I thought, you know, it felt like a long time, but it didn't. And man, it was just a different world with these students. I mean, they were awesome. They were mostly freshmen and I loved teaching them you know, intro to philosophy ethics, which I always do love. But the big difference was the technology. So there, you know, I, again, I'm teaching old school, like, okay, you read your 
your Plato, you read your Aristotle's ethics and you come to class and you know, you're ready to talk. I'll, I'll give you maybe a question or two to think about while you read and you come, well, they want like, you know, YouTube videos and, and those types of things. So I, you know, I, I want to get with it and be open-minded. So I had them show me and, and they actually really enjoyed showing me. And it was actually really cool. It was like, oh, wow, these little snippets. Then I could point out to them which ones had it right and it, which ones were a little mistaken and how they described it. And then I, I was complaining one day when, you know, when I first get to class, I usually try and chit chat with them. And they asked me how I was and I said, oh, my TV remote stopped working and the cable is, you know, my satellite is out. And they're like, satellite? What do you, what do you have? And, you know, I told them, <laughs> You know, I got direct TV. They're like, why, why do you, why don't you just get Netflix or, you know? <laughs> so they talked me into it and I started watching Breaking Bad and I came, I came to class the next day. They, they said, how do you like Netflix? I had told them I got, I had gotten it. I said, yeah, I started watching this series, Breaking Bad. And then they got all excited. So they're like, where are you at? Which season? <laughs> On their final exam, the last question was, what should Dr. Luceno watch next? on Netflix. They enjoyed uh, getting me into the, the new century. What a wild experiment. Uh, <laughs> so, so much like research and development money goes into Netflix being able to predict, you know, what you watch as a viewer based off of, you know, your behaviors and all that. So I can mm -hmm. only imagine <laughs> that being basically curated by a class <laughs> of students <laughs> who are now shaping. Um, I, th I think it also points to a, a pretty valuable form of instruction and willingness to, to iterate that, that certainly, you know, uh, will help folks with this transition, which is you, you opened up uh, that dialogue and decided to say, you know, what what forms of information delivery, you know, work for you or compel you um, and, you know, your willingness to engage with that and even, you know, be the subject matter expert when it comes to like, oh, interesting video. This is maybe where they fall short. Um, turning that into a dialogue is so valuable, especially now. And I think that that's going to be extremely helpful for, you know, figuring out how to make things work <laughs> from here on in, um, exploring our new normals. So that, that gives me a lot of hope. To, to hear well, that. It, what I've found a lot is asking others is, is not something that everybody's comfortable with. Like when you don't know, again, going back to Socrates, when you don't know something, admitting it and saying, I could use some help with this, um, or I could make it better by asking help for help, thinking about teaching specifically. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect at that either. I don't think anybody is. I'm finding that it's easier, especially for faculty who've been around, but also grad students. You know, they'll have taught sometimes, some of them, a couple years and think, I don't need workshops, I'm an expert now. And I'm like, two years? I've been teaching 20 years. I like to think I'm good at teaching, I, I, I think I am, but, but I'm not perfect, I can still learn a lot you know, especially now with the online, but always, we can always get better. And when you think that you have learned all there is to know, I think that's a big problem. So I'm finding that people are instructors, TAs are no, now less hesitant to ask for help, which I think is a wonderful thing. You know, again, I've never taught online myself. And going back to philosophy, I think subjects like that there's a lot of thought out there like, how are you gonna do that online, right? That's gotta be face-to-face. -face. Um, no, it doesn't have to. I mean, it's fun to, to be face-to-face -face. Um, and that's what we're used to, but there's so many ways now to recreate that online. It's not exactly the same, it's true, but there's ways to recreate it. I think it just takes work and that's, we're all busy, so we don't necessarily have time for that work, which I understand. It reminds me that that expanding definition of, of creativity, which can be more applied to uh, forms of, of problem solving, um, where, you know, just thinking of, of Zoom, for instance, it's Zoom generally is just, just a fascinating place to spend all your time. Like now we've got all, all kinds of concepts of Zoom etiquette that, that we're all having to, to learn in real time and develop in real time. Um, 
I, I guess what, what comes to mind for something like a, a philosophy course or other types of uh, courses that would benefit from group discussion in real time. Or for larger groups, you might have uh, raised hands, uh, for instance, and you can kind of go down uh, that list in this little user interface. You would queue people up based off of you know when they want to engage, let them be seen or heard. I guess not many people can become invisible uh, in person if they decide to shut off their camera, uh, much as you know some of us uh, socially anxious people might like to. It's interest. It's it's a f interesting form of problem solving that at least I, I I think it would be. It's fun to engage with, um, but that's also because you know, me being someone who spends a lot of time around media tools, uh, figuring out new ways that they can become solutions is that's my bag. Yeah, exactly. Well, have you taught um, online? Uh, no, no. I've I've never taught. I've done like personal media training. <laughs> so back when I used to work at uh, WFSU at the uh, little indie radio station on campus, which those yeah. were some of the best years during undergrad. Um, I worked at, at the radio station undergrad at, you did? in Wisconsin. Yeah. So we both were, were radio station folks. No kidding. We, we had five watts. I don't know what <laughs> w, <laughs> WFSU has, but we had five. We, we, we reached our signal would only reach the dorms and uh, the city jail. So we <laughs> we got people in in you know that were in jail uh, calling up to request songs. I was a DJ, and then I eventually somehow for some reason it was student run. So mm -hmm. I somehow became co manager with a friend. I mean, I shouldn't say I wasn't responsible, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Were, were someone, any of us? <laughs> someone thought I was uh, responsible enough to be the co-manager. I don't know. But now I'm getting real nostalgic. Well, weren't you a DJ? Yeah. Or so I, I worked all over the radio station. Um, okay. I came in as a, a newser. So um, I would come in. I think it was, I think I had the morning shift. So sometime around like six thirty. Uh, and I would deliver the news for about 10 minutes. You look up, I think it was an international story, national and then local, and you found ways to shorten each of them and then deliver them on air. So that's, that's typically your, your in before you get to a DJ position where then you would have more airtime. The, the most fun was, was just going into this catalog of, I'm pretty sure tens of thousands of, of CDs I'm getting real nostalgic now, um, and just you had CDs. We had we had uh, albums back. <laughs> we did. So we were one of the few, if maybe the only station in Tallahassee that did also have vinyl. Uh, we did play vinyl. I was always afraid of handling the vinyl, but every now and again, every now and again, I would I would get so brave. See, you were a real radio station, Tom. We, <laughs> we did not have news. We had these uh, PSAs we had to play occasionally, and they were eight track, right? <laughs> yeah. You put them in, and they were PSAs. Now you're making me nostalgic. We had a, a faculty <laughs> advisor. He was a poli sci guy, and he was a chain smoker, right? That, that was back in the day when you could smoke in your office <laughs> up on campus, right? He used yeah. to go into his office. I mean, he'd have to take a break during class to go smoke. So, Anyway, he was our uh, advisor. So he was in charge of us. So if, if we ever did anything, you know, stupid, we'd hear about it from him. I mean, I think we could pretty much play whatever. Like, I remember playing Zappa and a lot of indie stuff back then. We were WCCX. So I think it still exists. I think it's actually, like, it has rules now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I They're no longer rogue indie kids. <laughs> One summer, my friend, she lived at, at the radio station <laughs> because there was a bathroom and, you know, I think, it, I think, I don't know if it had a shower, but she was the manager at the time. So she just lived there. <laughs> you know, considering some of the folks I knew back at the radio station, that tracks. <laughs> Your turn makes a jump to light speed. But Sam! They're getting closer. Oh yeah? Watch this. Watch what? I think we're in trouble. Need a boost to get you going? Tune in to V89 from 6 to 10 a.m. on weekdays for Caffeine A Go Go. Playing the kind of upbeat tunes that'll solve any morning time hyperdrive motivator failure. Only here on WVFS Tallahassee. <laughs>
Oh, awesome. <laughs> That's you? Yeah, that was me. You um, have an awesome radio voice. Why, thank you. Wow. Um, and, and all of that stemming from uh, whether or not I had ever taught back when I was at the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love how conversations wander. But you know what? That is teaching. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Back when I was at the radio station, I, I taught people how to uh, edit uh, promos like that and how to um, deliver uh, voice stuff on uh on air, which makes me sound really professional when I describe it that way, uh, but doing basically vocal coaching. Why did you ever stop? That's really neat. <laughs> I kind of, uh, yeah, I kind of never did stop. Um, yeah. You know, seeing as I'm still creating video and audio materials for for people to take up. Um, oh, that's a good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah, I know. Teaching comes in so many different forms. I mean, people, when you hear the word teach, you think of a class, but it, uh, that's absolutely not the case it's not that small of a focus you know yeah so much um, of important teaching goes on outside of a classroom now uh things like uh people who who live stream uh from their bedrooms whether it's people who you know play video games or there are people who like paint miniature figurines uh or they're illustrating um, they are this new form of, of live entertainment and, you know, probably similar for, for the folks who listened at your prison. People, even just when it came to the radio, um, people felt like that was a presence in their lives when things were lonely. Being able to, to call in and say, I really like that song. What was it? That, that little bit of connection uh, with somebody was something that, you know, I experienced being a DJ. And I think a lot of people are seeking from things like, um, you know, people who, who live stream, uh, whether that's to a few people or for, for some folks, tens of thousands. Um, and now we hope to emulate that as much as possible when it comes to online learning, um, hoping that we can have enough uh, presence and connection. You know, I know that it's not always about making someone feel less lonely, but I don't know, maybe that can be a good knock on effect of being able to, you know, iterate on how we go about doing this and creating connections where previously it was difficult. I agree. I mean, and that's something that you you do get concerned about, especially right now as an uh, instructor, is teaching with compassion. Um, you know, I mean, the, we all have a lot of things going on right now, not only with the pandemic, um, you know, but about right, you know, the racism the issue of systemic racism that's going on. So, you know, that's obviously affecting a lot of people's lives right now, too. Um, and so we have a lot of people that are suffering in many different ways. And to, to teach them, we, you know, if, I think most of us feel, hopefully all of us feel like we have to connect with our students to teach them. And, and right now, that definitely means also showing compassion. It takes some energy and some know-how to figure out how to do that, especially with the platform we're using right now. Thank goodness, right? Thank goodness we have Zoom. I mean, that's, we all know that. I mean, we have to remind ourselves of it sometimes, but thank goodness. Because what would we do if we didn't? And, and platforms like it. And well, right, not just Zoom, but you know, since we're using Zoom, but right, I mean. If Zoom decides to sponsor this, then yes, thank goodness for Zoom specifically. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, you, you hit on a good point. It's amazing to, to think that in, in spite of something like a, a global pandemic, uh, movements like Black Lives Matter um, have been able to gain as much traction um, and become, you know, as prolific uh, as they are and we s I, I know that there are many people who want to embark on things like anti-racism work um, and just you know I know that even I struggled with the idea of like I recognize that that there are issues um, but I I'm in an immunocompromised household so I, I don't have nearly as much access to you know going out in the streets and demonstrating there um, and so it was a matter of finding within myself, what are ways within my sphere of influence um, that I can start thinking about, you know, making institutional changes. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes that means uh, looking within ourselves or within our own, you know, professional lives or institutions. Um, and so the idea of making instruction more accessible, you know, if that means not only being able to offer things online, taking into consideration, you know, I, I had a, one instructor who was talking about, you know, mo moving online. And I, I think that they were also someone who is quite traditional. Um, they wanted all of their students uh, to have their cameras on at all times. Um, and via that learning process, not being readily familiar with, with teaching online uh, and, you know, the perils therein, um, you realize, well, depending on where someone lives or what they can afford, not everybody has the same, you know, internet connection speeds. Uh, so some students simply didn't have the, the, the basics needed to keep their camera on and still engage. Um, so having the flexibility, you know, as small as it may seem, having the flexibility to, to understand, and like you say, uh, have that bit of compassion to say, all right, maybe not everybody needs their cameras on at all times. We can work with this, move forward with it. Um, these, these smaller considerations where we can realize we don't have to leave people behind. You know, that adds another, like you said, another area of ah, just stress to a student's life that is not fair. Yeah, and it's really, this has uncovered, of course, a lot of problems with accessibility. And I mean, that's hopefully something that we've learned or we will learn from this. And you know, that's, that's, that's definitely within our own power as individuals to explore and, and find those opportunities. Um, I feel like that's, that's certainly something, even within the purview of, of things that you already work on. Speaking of the Directo program, which you're uh, advisor to uh, had these, what have these conversations started to, to look like? Right now we're looking over all the proposals. So I, I can see where some of the conversations are gonna lead very centered on what is the pandemic? How is it affecting our ability to teach the students ability to learn? How are we as teachers, are we being effective in the ways we have to be teaching in this different platform? And, and what do we have to do different? And what can I share with others about what I'm learning? And then also, of course, with the other big um, topic that's going on in our, our country right now, the anti-racism movement, of course, which we should always be doing, um, it shouldn't just be right now, um, but the systemic racism uh, topic. We have a lot of uh, proposals uh, focused on that, and I'm really excited to see those conversations play out at the symposium and, and, and begin to really resonate more across campus. Uh, we have a panel of faculty that span a very diverse range of people of color. It's going to be very interesting to hear about, about their experiences on our campus. I guess me not being a person of color, I have thought about that, asking my friends that are people of color, well, what can I do? But then I do read, oh, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. You're an educated person, Lisa, figure it out yourself. You know, <laughs> there's books, you know, we have the internet, like we said, you can do it on your own. So taking it upon yourself to educate yourself. There's going to be a lot of interesting conversations I see come out of that. I'm really looking forward to that. It's always a time where you get the undergrads, the grads, the faculty, the staff together, and all these different perspectives to talk about these topics. It's so exciting. It, it reminds me, you know, very much of what you, you mentioned as far as uh, yeah, Socratic methods, um, but inviting your own fallibility uh, to the table. Um, and, you know, especially when it comes to things like uh, you know, anti-racism work, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion work. Be being willing to to make mistakes and maintain it as a practice. Um, so, you know, something that, that, that motivates me is making sure that I, I am being held uh, accountable and, and willing to learn um, and not feeling like I've arrived at the absolute right answer and, you know, all of a sudden I've, I've mastered it, I've done it. Um, the work is done because it never is. So the last uh, episode that, that I recorded was with two uh, undergrad students. Uh, one worked within the libraries. They're also black. And when I opened up the uh, discussion to, you know, bring, bring to me what's been on your mind. Tell me what your experience has been like. 
um, you know, as a, a student, as someone who is also, uh, you know, a part-time worker. Um, and it was, it was just this outpouring of all of the things that had been on their mind, um, that had never been asked of them. And they, they were truly just waiting for someone to say what's on your mind. Sometimes it's invisible to, to us, you know, at any level that's not student is that we, we tend to assume that top down, we're offering solutions based off of whatever we suspect <laughs> they, they might need. And not often enough is are they voices that are being invited so that they can simply have the floor. Honestly, Tom, that's what I think. That's why I think Directo in particular has been so successful. It was planned as a one-time event. It was it was planned as a book club. It was not planned as, as a symposium and a year-round event. Mm -hmm. Like I'm saying is the reason it's been as successful it is, as it's been is because it's grad student driven. Um, yeah, I'm the advisor and I do help them, but but they run it, they run the show. And, and I think because they're asking, they're asking for people's ideas. It's not, and you know, that's nothing against the upper administration, whether or not they intend it, because I'm sure they don't, they, they really want to know how we feel, but we're guarded, right? People are guarded. But when the grad students ask, they're in the perfect sweet spot of in between the undergrads and the faculty. So they ask and they're just more approachable. It's like the grad students are asking me. So when people ask them, because I'm telling you some of these proposals, it's like, wow, this is gonna be good. You know, yeah. I didn't expect people to be so open. Talking about some of the experiences they've had in the classroom or with implicit bias and really thinking about it and applying it in their classroom and trying to figure out how am I being biased in the classroom that I didn't think I was and my experiences as a person of color at FSU. I'm like, how much are you going to talk about this? This is interesting. <laughs> I think that you're onto something when you say that it, it kind of sometimes it depends on who's asking. But also that somebody, that somebody is asking, like you said, that somebody really wants to know. Lisa, thank you so much uh, for for joining me and, and talking about so much. I love that I get to, to you know, take in these perspectives and learn a little bit um, with each person I meet. Are there any closing words that, that you would have for us or? Just, I really want to thank you, Tom, for doing this project and taking it on because it's it's so unique. It's such a a great opportunity to hear about different people's um, just what they're doing at this time and how this is all affecting them that I think it's just wonderful you're doing this. So thank you on behalf of the whole university for doing this. That's so kind. Well, thank you. And you do take care. <laughs>